Welcome everybody to another episode of the Sapien Podcast. Today, you guys got me. It's just me. We don't have a guest, but it's going to be a special episode. Um, this episode was inspired by my consulting in my office. I'm going to disclaimer it that none of these are recommendations. Do not take this as medical advice. Um, but these are some ideas that I think will be meaningful to people that want to understand how to eat correctly. Um, so far, this season has been really focused on the integration of the mind, body, spirit connection. But as we talked about, nutrition is the anchor point of your health. Understanding how to eat is so important. Um, if you haven't listened before, please listen to episode 11 of the Sapien podcast, where we talk about in general, the Sapien diet and a human way to eat. I'll review it quickly. Just, just the big picture ideas. Essentially what the Sapien diet is, is avoiding processed food. Number one, processed food is what's making us sick. And as we go through the examples today, I will explain to you what to look for in some food products, how to look at ingredient labels so that you can avoid processed food. Uh, Cause some people don't even know what that means. Um, secondly, we focus on a high protein diet with carbohydrate restriction and we embrace healthy fats. Today, we'll talk about what those healthy fats are, and I'll give you guys some examples. We won't get a chance to go too much into the meat discussion, but I will bring up some key factors to think about when you're shopping for food. Um, and obviously, carbohydrate restriction is so critical. I've talked about it probably at nauseum at this point, uh, but I will also kind of talk about some snacks that um, are sort of best in class. And I'll give you guys a bunch of references uh, where I learned a lot of these things and where you can go to learn more about it. Uh, because there's no way this podcast will be all inclusive of all of the ideas, but certainly uh, a great place to start when it comes to understanding how to buy healthy food and how to shop and how to look through some of the confusion in the food system. Um, podcast is going to be really informal. Um, I'm going to have fun with it. Um, a lot of it, if you're one of my patients already, you've heard it all a million times. It's important to hear it over and over again, because some of this stuff can be so confusing. So we'll make sure to reinforce some really critical ideas. Um, but in general, this is the stuff I talk about with patients. Once we get past, um, understanding what a ketogenic, low carbohydrate animal based diet is. And, um, I won't touch too much today on intermittent fasting. I think it's one of the most critical parts of this. Um, perhaps we can do a whole separate episode on intermittent fasting again, but if you look through previous episodes of this podcast, you'll find a lot of information about fasting. Um, today is all about practical tricks and tips, how to shop, how to look at, in, uh, how to look at ingredient labels and just how to understand some of the marketing and, uh, uh, sort of processes you need to go through to pick healthy foods when you go shopping. Um, I've got Chase here. He's my producer. He, I'll be talking to him intermittently and he's going to be helping pull up some content for us online. And I do have a goodie bag of, uh, essentially my pantry things that I use. Um, I'm going to give one more disclaimer. I have no interest in any of these brands. I have no financial interests or obligations to any brands in the food and health space. I'm just a physician uh, that is trying to guide my patients and the public on how to eat in a healthy way. Anything I show today are just examples. It's regional. I live, I live in Los Angeles, California, so it's going to be different if you live in a different part of the country. But the principles, the concepts, the way we look at nutrition labels is true no matter where you're at. Um, so with that being said, we're going to get started. First things first, salt. Salt is one of the most misunderstood concepts in nutrition. We've all been vilified and fear mongered that salt is bad for you. Salt is not bad for you. Um, it is essential. It is an essential mineral. Sodium chloride without it, you will die. It used to be uh, many, many, many years ago, thousands of years ago, that we traded salt. Salt was such a important component of, of living as a human, preserving meat, preparing food, that we actually used it for trade. Uh, now, uh, the, the story on salt is very confusing. Most people have heard that if you eat too much salt, you're gonna get high blood pressure and it's bad for you. It's just not true, I'm sorry. 
doctors, people that continue to say that it's a weird thing to say. I'll give you guys some examples of why that's true. But basically, in order to create uh, your in order for your blood and your fluid in your body to stay inside of your veins and arteries, you have to have oncotic pressure that is created by uh, protein and by uh, salts and minerals. If you become too low in salt, you die. It's called hyponatremia. When your sodium is too low, that is critical and people die from that. Um, if your salt is too high, you can die from that. So uh, it is very, your body has a robust system of managing salt. And that is mostly done through your kidneys. Of course, if a patient has kidney disease, severe heart disease, uh, salt recommendations can change, but we're generally talking about most people. Uh, that includes if you have type two diabetes, but no severe kidney disease, you know, some people with heart disease, but it's not an overt heart failure. Uh, I still think salt is critical, important. Most people walk around dehydrated. Most people are always dehydrated because they're not drinking enough water and we're consuming all of these products that are sweet and palatable and we're not taking in enough hydration. Uh, drinking free water, that's just water without any salt, minerals, or solute in it, um, it doesn't actually hydrate you. Because your body needs salt to absorb into your blood vessels, if you drink too much free water, you end up wasting away your salt, you pee out all your salt, and you end up hyponatremic, low sodium. And that's dangerous, like we talked about. So we recommend, in general, a low-salt diet, then patients go to the hospital. I was a hospitalist for many years. And what do we do? We give them normal saline, right? IV fluids. What is normal saline? Saline is salt water. It is literally salt water. So when you get sick and you go to the hospital, you get salt water and then you get discharged and they say, eat a low salt diet. It, that part, as you can see, makes no sense. Okay. When patients are on a low salt diet and I send them to the kidney doctor and their sodiums are low because they're on drugs that make them pee out their sodium and they're on a low salt diet and they're avoiding salt like the plague they're convinced it is, kidney doctors very commonly prescribe sodium chloride tablets. That's a weird thing to do when you could very easily just add salt to the diet. So there's a lot of disconnections and inconsistencies in the medicine space as it relates to salt. Um, I think it's important. I think you should be consuming a good amount of salt, a gram or two a day for most people. And I don't really recommend a low salt diet. However, I do recommend eating healthy salt. And so that's what we want to talk about right now. Healthy salt is important. I think most people have heard how good pink Himalayan salt is or Celtic salt or Redmond's Real Salt, which is an American brand where they mine salt from a, from a Utah mine. That stuff makes sense. It's real salt, but most people are not eating real salt. So we're going to look here and we're going to see what most people are eating. They're recommended to eat iodized table salt. And probably this is the most popular brand. So we use this as an example, but this is true of almost all uh, versions of iodized table salt. So you would assume that a salt, the ingredient, the ingredients are salt, right? <laughs> there shouldn't be other ingredients in salt because it's a foundational fundamental like basic product that we add to food, right? So let's look at Morton table salt, iodized table salt, and let's look at the ingredients. And that's what we're doing. We're looking at ingredients and we're understanding what they mean. So first ingredient is salt. You should know that in America, uh, companies are required to list ingredients by their order of how much is in there. So the first ingredient will have the most amount in the product. And as we go down the list, there's, th there's less of that stuff. So it, it's basically by the quantity of the product in it. So clearly this is mostly salt. Then they add an anti-caking agent, which is calcium uh, silicate. Not a huge fan of anti-caking agents because salt shouldn't cake. Salt is a mineral, and if it's left dry, it doesn't stick to itself. So it makes no sense to put anti-caking agents in salt in general. But here's where it gets wild, and this is it. They put dextrose in our salt. Dextrose is a highly inflammatory sugar product, often derived from corn. Uh, it's highly processed, it's highly inflammatory, and it's sugar. Yes, you heard me right. They put sugar in our salt. That's wild. 
That's unacceptable, and that's what makes people sick. The original studies uh, from the 1970s, when they looked at salt uh, for, I think, the 60s or 70s, they looked at how salt affects blood pressure, and the correlation was more salt equals higher blood pressure. Well, that study was not very well put together. There was multiple confounding variables, as is common with a food nutrition study because it's so hard to control all the variables. And we'll talk about some other nutritional studies, but basically you can't control everything someone eats. So you control what you can, and then they report to you everything else. And that is a bad way to do science. And it's a bad way to make conclusions from its guidance, but it's not conclusions. I believe that a lot of the problems we saw with salt is because we're using iodized table salt that has processed chemicals in it. And I think that's wildly inappropriate and should not be illegal. Personally, I don't think they should be allowed to put dextrose in salt, even if that's what's required to put uh, iodine in it. I think there's other ways to get iodine. And I don't think we should be adding sugar to our salt. Um, So... There's a recent study uh, where they looked at salt intake and blood pressure. And what they found was salt transiently elevated blood pressure for a couple of hours. And then that resolved. That actually makes sense, right? Because the salt increases your blood volume, right? Because the salt plus the water goes into your blood vessels, increases your fluid, and that can increase blood pressure. But your kidneys will process the salt and that blood pressure will normalize. Um, I don't think being afraid of being a tr- of a transient elevating of blood pressure makes sense to avoid salt because what you end up is dehydrated, feeling weak, not feeling optimal because you don't have the minerals to operate your body. So this fear of high blood pressure that's unfounded uh, has led to more problems than benefits. So I got some examples of really healthy salt, and these are just some examples, okay? Literally from my pantry. Um, Pink salt. We all know about pink salt, pink Himalayan salt. This is mined from Pakistan. All pink Himalayan salt comes from a mine in Pakistan. There's some concerns that it could be adulterated. I've heard that and I've seen some reports. Um, I don't, I haven't done that much inquiry into it, but suffice to say the only ingredient in this bottle is salt, which is the point. Okay. Um, Another example would be Celtic salt. This is a sea salt product. Um, It's really, really nice because it has a lot of these minerals uh, that are from natural salt sources. They actually have other minerals in it, not just sodium chloride. That's probably the most natural version of consuming salt. Because people get busy and people get dehydrated, and since we do a lot of intermittent fasting in my world, Um, having a way to get your salt quickly, um, when you're on the road is really important. Now there's other products. This is just one, uh, Rob Wolf came up with, um, it's called element and it contains sodium, potassium, and magnesium salt. So we have all three of the critical kinds of salt. Um, they have some great flavors. Now this product is not perfect. Okay. The idea here is it's much better than drinking juice, which is high in sugar, a soda, which is high in sugar and often chemicals. Um, this does, this has a bit of stevia extract. It does have natural flavors, which I'm not a huge fan of, but when you're on the road and you need something delicious to drink and you want to get hydrated, this is a great example. I always kind of reference Gatorade here. See Gatorade had the right idea. Uh, Football players were getting dehydrated. They were you know, getting sick on the football field and they realized they were sweating out all their salt. So Gatorade was invented to refresh the minerals in a patient's, in in an athlete's body. And those electrolytes, they make a lot of sense. Over the decades of popularity, they basically added so much sugar into Gatorade that it became very, very, very unhealthy. I used to recommend basically taking a Gatorade and maybe uh, 25 or 30% of it and then diluting out the rest. That way you drop the sugar load. I think this is a better option. Uh, it's not perfect, but it has no sugar. It's a good gram of salt. It gives you all three of the salts, magnesium, sodium, 
and potassium salts. It's not bad. There's other great products. I will also mention Redmond's Real Salt has a great product and there's many other competitors. Here's the thing, guys. You don't want it to have products like maltodextrin or carrageenan. Those are toxic preservatives that are highly inflammatory and highly processed. Dextrin, dextrose, as we mentioned, um, color additants when you see color number five, color number seven. These things are toxic. So while this one's not perfect, there are some other better ones. This one tastes really good and is relatively healthy, and it doesn't contain any of these really inflammatory uh, byproducts. There's other brands out there that are really, really popular that used to be very comparable to this, and recently I've noticed they added multidextrin, which is really, really insane to add to a salt product. And I, I challenge you, whatever salt you might have at home, always look at the ingredient labels. And if you have questions, ask your doctor, send me a message on Instagram, whatever, figure it out. Don't consume processed garbage when you're eating your salt. And don't be afraid to consume salt because of a bunch of misunderstandings over the decades. So if you're on the road and you're feeling dehydrated and you know there's only a 7-Eleven or a Quickie Mart or a gas station available, um, Redmond's makes little packets <laughs> that you can carry. These come in little individual packets. As you guys can see, I keep them in my car. I, or I buy like a 32 ounce water. I dump it in. I shake it up. That's my go-to. If you don't have the salt packets, I like the Gatorade trick. I still think it's good. You buy a water, you buy a Gatorade, you chug like half the water and then you pour the Gatorade in and now you've gotten some tasty water that's like, that's you know, the Gatorade's diluted. They also make uh, products now, uh, it depends on which store you're in, that's like a, a, a electrolyte water, things like that. Um, so yeah, th there's moves. Uh, I, I think the, the best version of it, though, is to find a product like Redmond's or Element and just keep it in your bag, in your car, in your glove box. The stuff lasts a long time. It's salt. It doesn't really expire if you keep it dry. And, uh, and I would do that. You know what I mean? The other part of it is, it should be mentioned, if you're on the road and you just ate out and you just had a huge salt load from your food, you don't need to add more salt, right? So if you've had the huge salt load from the food, start drinking water, right? So uh, you've got to be conscious of what you're putting in your mouth, right? It's not like, uh, you know, when you've decided, oh, I'm thirsty and, oh, I'm just going to do salt water. Well, no. What if you ate too much salt earlier today? Drink water by all means. You've got to be conscious of what you're doing. But uh, it is always tricky on the road. And, and we'll mention some of that when we're, we're talking about snacks because there's a lot of tricks uh, with snacking when you're on the road and people struggle with that. Uh, uh, as far as salt goes, um, I'll just say one last thing about salt. Um, it's critical for fasting. When you're fasting, your body is using more water. It's using more salt. Uh, it's getting rid of toxins. It's going through a different metabolic process when you go into ketosis. So it is the most critical to make sure your minerals, your salt, your magnesium, your potassium is being taken care of when you're fasting. A lot of people will have like the keto flu, um, when they start fasting, that's what they call it. Um, or they're low carb and they start fasting. And really a lot of the time that's a mineral deficiency. And so making sure you're getting your salt water, especially on fasted days, it helps suppress your appetite because it keeps you, sometimes people struggle um, and they don't realize it. They struggle understanding the difference between being hungry and thirsty. A lot of people wake up quote unquote hungry, but if they just drank a large salt water, they'd realize they were just dehydrated. They just needed a little bit more uh, hydration and then the hunger pains go away. So for all of those reasons, you should really understand salt Think about your salt intake and as it relates to your water intake and don't consume iodized table salt with dextrose. It's wildly unhealthy and bizarre. All right, moving on, guys. We're going to talk about water. It's not the most exciting. So, uh, we're going to talk about water. It's not the most exciting topic um, in my eyes, but it connects to salt. So we'll just mention it briefly. Consuming enough water is critical. We just talked about how important hydration is. We talked about how free water does not really go into your blood vessels and doesn't hydrate you if it doesn't have the minerals it needs. So making sure you're getting your salt with your water is important. pH balanced water has become really popular and I think there's something to it. I, I would caution people 
who think that drinking pH balanced water is going to make some dramatic improvement in their health. I think it's nice. I think it's uh, probably a little bit better for your body and your, your whole metabolism. But I don't think it's one of these things that should be focused on too much because there's so many issues in nutrition. I would focus more on making sure you have the right salt intake and clean water and the pH of it to me is not a critical thing. Some people disagree with me on this. I'm open to changing my mind, but I haven't really seen anything that overwhelms me to think that pH balanced water is such a critical thing. I also worry about uh, companies selling really expensive products that make a uh, pH balanced water or selling water at really high cost because it's pH balanced. I think that's weird. Um, this alkaline water that's sold for $2 more, it's just, it's not worth it. And I think it's a bit of a uh, spending money where it's not going to make the best difference in your health. Um, that's what I think about that. I do think it's important to get filtered water in your home if you can. Uh, they sell really great osmosis filters um, that aren't super expensive and easy to install. Of course, people have Brita filters, but I do think it's worth uh uh, making sure you're drinking really clean water anytime you can. And of course, I think most people know this, but avoiding plastic bottled water. Products that are in plastic, uh, there's microplastics that can seep into the water. There's also this concern about phthalates. Uh, there's some really great information out there uh, where these microplastics from the water could be contributing significantly to even issues with our development as human beings. Uh, there's some really interesting work looking at phthalates and how it affects uh, your taint, which is a part of your body between your, uh, between your uh, rectum and your uh, genitals and that it's shrinking. And there's a lot of meaning to that. There's concerns that it could be affecting our hormone system. So in general, avoid plastic bottled water. You don't know how long it's been sitting in the sun and cooking. And I, I used to not think so much about this, but I think it's probably a pretty pretty talk pretty obvious source of toxicity in our lives is, is these uh is this plastic um drink a lot of water you know there's a lot of different guidance on this 100 milliliters 100 cc's 120 is it 90 drink enough water with enough salt you should feel great you shouldn't be dehydrated and it's normal to pee a lot it like if you're hydrating all the time and you're active, if you're fasting all the time, you should be urinating a lot. And I don't, I think some people get worried about that, but in reality it's normal, um, especially if you're staying hydrated. So um, if you have any other questions about that, we can talk about it more, but I think that covers water. Next up, okay, I wanna get into a topic that is probably the most commonly asked question to me uh, when we start talking about nutrition, intermittent fasting, low carb, animal based diet, uh, avoiding processed foods, it's snacks, right? People can pretty much figure out, you know, eating like lots of protein, embracing fat, avoiding bad carbs. That makes sense. But snacking is really tricky. We're marketed aggressively uh, as to what to snack. And uh, it's very easy to make it seem like something's healthy that's not. It's very easy to go into a health food store and feel like you're getting something healthy and you're not unless you're looking at the ingredients and really, really understand what we're talking about. I think Chase is gonna pull up some common uh, like snacks and what I'd love you to do, Chase, is pull up some of their ingredient lists because that's what I want people to start looking at. So I already mentioned, but carrageenan is a really toxic a preservative, dextrin, dextrose, maltodextrin, all highly processed, highly toxic corn byproducts and, and sugar byproducts, color number, whatever. Uh, and, and there's so many others and, and we'll, we'll hit on some of them, but let, let's, let's look at like the first one. I, I, I really like the, the, the Doritos example because it's so common. And, and, and I'll, I'll also say this, if you compare the ingredients of Doritos in America to other countries, you'll notice way more ingredients, way more bizarre ingredients in America. What has happened to our food system is a complete disaster. Um, the government organizations that are set to manage these are not managing them. Food companies are using more and more highly toxic substances. They're using chemicals that are insanely palatable that trick your brain to consume more and more and more and more and 
it's causing disease. So let's look at Doritos. Whole corn and then corn. Okay, so corn, it's, it's a corn chip, it makes sense. I'd like it to say organic corn because organic corn is gonna have less pesticides and toxins and uh, you know, non-GMO would be nice. Genetically, genetically modified organisms are not, shouldn't be like the gold standard of food. We should be eating natural, normal foods, wild foods. But, you know, that's a tough one. But here's the big one, vegetable oil, right? And it's a combination of corn, canola, and sunflower oil. If I can tell you guys anything, it's that seed oils, which are vegetable oils, because when we say vegetable oils, we're actually talking about um, the seeds of vegetables that are pulverized, heated, and manipulated with chemicals to extract the oil. Those chemical like those oils so like corn oil canola oil are byproducts of industrial agriculture and have made it into our food system for bizarre reasons um, i'm going to get more into the oil but basically you need to avoid vegetable oils like the plague that they are the oils that are healthy to eat are fruit oils and animal oils and i'm going to go over that in our next segment but avoiding vegetable oil is so important and i'm going to show you some alternatives to the typical snack chips where we're using olive oil and coconut oil and our superior products. Um, my hope is that over time they'll start using things like lard and beef tallow, which are animal fats and are very, very healthy way of producing these kind of chips and snacks and I think would make the products taste even better. It's just not highly lucrative because those fats are expensive and vegetable oil is a byproduct of industrial agriculture. It's cheap and it makes you sick so slowly that no one notices it and we're over here yelling to everyone, stop eating seed oils and very few people want to listen. So I'm going to keep reinforcing that. Don't eat vegetable oils or seed oils. Eat fruit oils and animal-based oils. I'll explain more later. But let's keep looking at Doritos. So we've got corn oil and sunflower oil. What do we have next? Corn dextrin. So a highly processed byproduct of corn. Uh, then we have salt. Fine. Then we have cheddar cheese. Cool. Uh, we get into some other chemicals, monosodium glutamate, uh, we get into some more corn flour, some seasonings. Then we get into uh, the onions. So now we're seasoning, now we're using corn. But now we're back to more dextrose. So they cover these things in sugar. It's weird. And then at the bottom, you start looking at some of these other chemicals, which are hard to pronounce. They don't need to be in there. Those are not necessary. And if you look at, again, the same product in other countries, I don't want to do that right now. You guys can do this on your own. It's just too nuanced, but you'll see the difference. All of these products I'm mentioning, all of these corn byproducts won't be in there. Why? Because in America, we grow corn, wheat, and soy. Okay. Those make money. They're cheap to grow. They're genetically modified. We use tons of pesticides. We can grow them on scale. We have tons of them. And more importantly, and scare, and to me, which is the scary thing is that Farmers are subsidized to grow this stuff. So they make more money growing this stuff and the food companies make more money selling it to you at a premium when it costs them nothing. And then drug companies make lots of money on the chronic diseases that are the outcome of consuming this stuff all the time. So you guys have heard this before, but like that's the system we're in. And that's why I'm sitting here reviewing ingredient lists. So. Let's talk about some chips that are best in class. There's a new brand called Siete, S-I-E-T-O. I have no financial interest in Siete. I have only an interest in this is a new brand that is showing really high quality ingredients. They're best in class. Um, so we're gonna pull that up. Um, while we're talking about this, this is another very important thing, you guys. I didn't come up with this on my own. I learned it from the community. There's an amazing uh, guy, Bobby Parrish. He goes by Flav City, F-L-A-V City. Um, he's on Instagram. He's on YouTube. He, uh, when he says something is Bobby approved, it's Sapien approved. We have the same approach and conceptualization of the nutrition system. He's an amazing guy because he goes to different stores and reviews what the stores have. He has videos on how to purchase eggs, how to purchase chips, how to purchase salt, how to pick the best product in every class. I think it's the most important resource any of you can listen to. 
if you're shopping for your family, if you're struggling how to purchase the right food, this is the place where you start. This is the guy who taught me so much. He is a great resource. I'm a huge fan. He's got a bunch of great food products you can purchase too. And he even does cooking shows. So he shows you how to cook healthy food at home. I can't speak highly enough of Flav City. His wife has a great channel where she talks about desserts and making them in a healthy way. So it's really great. Siete, uh, again, no financial interest. They have really, really great products. They're cooking everything in avocado oil and olive oil. Both of them are fruit oils, right? Because they have seeds and those are fruits. Um, they make everything with uh, with organic cassava flour. They leave the processed corn products out of it. They do a great job making the best in class ingredients, um, best in class product by using the cleanest ingredients. This is maybe local to me. This came out very, very recently in my local sprouts. Um, the idea is that you might not find Siete, but you might find a lot of similar products and maybe you guys can share them with me, right? Um, we wanna push the food system to respond to us with our dollars. So we're gonna buy products that make sense and the food system will respond. Uh, I'll talk about a number of companies during this talk that are doing this. Um, but I want while we're talking about chips, Siete is really great. But So let's look at this as an example. Cassava flour, cassava is a starchy uh, tuber. It's like an underground root vegetable. So we're not talking about seeds. We're not talking about grains. We're talking about a, a version of like a potato, right, which is an acceptable carbohydrate. Uh, we have avocado oil, so a healthy oil. We have tapioca flour, which is great. Coconut flour, great. Chia seeds, super high in omega-3s. We've got sea salt, not regular salt, real sea salt, as we talked about previously. And uh, that's it. What is that? One, two, three, four, five, six ingredients, you guys. That's what it takes to make a chip, right? You don't need 20 ingredients, 10 of which you can't pronounce. If you see that, it's not good for you. You don't need to do that much more research. Less ingredients is often better. It doesn't take that much time to turn the bag around and, or the box around and look at the ingredients. You, oftentimes, the pricing on this stuff isn't even that different. It's just new and very few people are figuring this out. And, you know, a year ago, this I never even heard of this product. It didn't exist in stores and I wasn't buying any chips at all because I couldn't find a decent product. So, you know, the tides are changing. I think this is a timely podcast and will age well in that sense that there will, by the time a lot of you are listening, there's going to be a lot of other competitors and that's great. We want to create uh, a, a competitive market to really push healthy foods. They shouldn't be that expensive. There's less ingredients in them. Um, it's just, you know, us understanding that eating Doritos that are overwhelmed with chemicals is really bad for our brains and our metabolisms. Uh, but having snacks is not necessarily like this terrible thing um, if we're doing it with thought. So Siete is a great option there. Um, there's other simple stuff. Uh, I'm going to show you some examples here, but like make your own popcorn. So much of the popcorn that we buy, even when it's pre-popped in like a pre-made bag uh, or, you know, those tins, they're covered in vegetable oil. That's how they keep it in the bag. They're covered in some kind of vegetable oil, corn oil, canola oil, sunflower oil. You don't need to put more vegetable oil in your body. Buy the organic corn, put it on a thing, make your own popcorn. It's easy, you know. Um, there's other really great brands. I'm going to pull them out right now. These are, again, just a couple of examples. Again, I want to emphasize what I'm showing you guys here is how to look at ingredients. I'm not marketing these brands. I'm marketing the approach to making food products. These brands will evolve. New brands will pop up. And if you know how to look at an ingredient label, you're going to be able to protect yourself from garbage, right? So anything that's made from vegetable oils is to be avoided. And there's often a product that's comparable. Um, this is a newer product. My, my wife actually is a really huge fan of it. Um, it's just another example of how you can get like a, 
uh, what are the wheat thins, right? And all these little chips. And they're all, if you look at it, it's going to look very similar to Doritos. Uh, they're going to have a lot of weird chemicals, a lot of preservatives, and definitely vegetable oil. Um, I'm just going to use this as an example. This is a chip made out of brown rice flour, potato starch, extra virgin olive oil, sunflower seeds, sea salt, white pepper, and done, right? That's all it takes to make a cracker, right? And that's about six or eight ingredients, and it's really, really good for you. And look at the label. They let you know exactly what's on it. So this is a new move where they're putting all the ingredients right on the front. They're saving you the trouble of having to turn the label over. Um, that's great, and that means they know what they're doing. If they put the ingredients on the front, that means they're honest and open. And most of these are like gluten-free products. A lot of them are corn-free products. We want to avoid these these uh these grains and, and sort of processed foods uh this is actually my favorite it's my version of cheez it's here's a really fun uh thing cheese it to make the cheesy flavor instead of using cheese which some people want to avoid dairy and instead of using chemical cheese powders like doritos they put nutritional yeast paprika and garlic I cannot tell you guys how cool nutritional yeast is. It's really popular in the vegan community, actually. It creates a cheesy flavor, and it creates an umami flavor. It's a great way to season uh, your food, um, make um, like a breading for, you know, a piece of chicken or something, and really add a lot of flavor, and it's really good for you for a number of reasons. So that's great. Uh, this is my Cheez-Its. I love them. I eat them. Not all the time, but often. Uh, here's a really cool brand called Hue, and they make chocolate, right? No refined sugar, no cane sugar, no sugar alcohols, non-dairy, no lecithins, no palm oil. It's cool. This is made out of organic cashews, organic cacao, organic coconut sugar, which is a really nice form of sugar. Uh, that's a better glycemic load than just regular sugar. It's got some cocoa butter, some organic vanilla bean, um, and sea salt. So again, really, really low sugar, really, really healthy version of chocolate. They sell them everywhere now, really growing popularity. And I think you'll see a lot more of these kind of products coming to market. Um, because I think people have an appetite for this stuff and there's a way to really make it healthy and it's not that complicated. Lastly, from what I brought from my pantry, pork rinds. If you love chips and you love something crunchy, but you want to stay low carb and you want to avoid like even the, even the cassava flour, right? Cause you're trying to be keto or you're really trying to keep your carbs down. Uh, this is pork skin, sea salt, pink Himalayan salt, and that's it, right? Um, I, I think it's really, really great. I use this a lot. I will just say it's really heavy, okay? Um, there's probably other versions where they have like pasture-raised uh, pigs, which is the healthiest uh, sort of pork product, but this is pretty good. Again, it's just better than a chip in my eyes and it's pretty filling um and and a great option that a lot of people don't think about um okay and now some just like other minor things i wanted to mention don't when, look nuts and seeds are really popular as a snack because you know they're low carb and they're really filling but don't buy roasted or pre-mixed nuts and seeds why because they put vegetable oil in there. How do they roast it? They roast it in vegetable oil, right? Uh, when they pre-mix them, they often put some oil in there to sort of keep it all stable. Um, so in order to avoid those seed oils, I recommend buying nuts and seeds from those bulk bins raw and just toasting them yourself. Like it's not that hard. We all have a toaster at home or most of us do. Just pop it in there, watch it. It gets nice and toasty. You don't even need to add oil. Or if you want to toast it yourself on a pan, you can actually put some avocado oil, some of the, uh, the some of this olive oil I'm going to show you guys, or even some animal fat, and you can make an actual healthy roasted nut or seed. And, and then you know everything that went in it, and you know that it's great. Um, one more thing on the topic of snacks uh, for my pantry. All right, 
I like to snack on high protein meal foods, especially if I'm really busy. I want to have a snack that's going to keep me full. And people seem to be afraid of canned products. I think canned products are a great way to go, especially when you need a snack and you're on the move, especially when you're trying to stay low carb, you're trying to stay animal based and you want to get some protein in your body. I brought a couple examples of things I eat all the time. Again, uh, these are just the products I had in my pantry. The idea is to look for similar products and I'll tell you what to look for and embrace some canned seafood. Look, canned seafood, uh, if you're getting it from a good source and you're making sure the products that are used inside of it are good, you're gonna be uh, in a good spot. And so let me go through it. So one of the most popular ones is Wild Planet. Wild Planet is a great company. It procures all of its seafood uh, through wild catch sources. And most of the time, they're putting it in olive oil or water. Uh, again, ex organic extra virgin olive oil, water, and some sea salt. That's pretty good. These are my favorite wild Pacific sardines. I know people are afraid of sardines. Uh, it's really rich. Mackerel. We got a picture of mackerel. Mackerel's a really healthy fish. I'm a huge fan of Wild Planet. They make a lot of really great seafood. They do it in a sustainable way. They really do protect the planet. Um, I think that this is a great underappreciated source of protein, source of healthy omega-3 fats, easy to eat. Okay, it smells a little, you know what? Nothing's perfect. It's pretty darn good. And I think if I challenge you guys, try it. Put a little shot of organic spicy brown uh, mustard and give it a dip. It's not as fishy as you think. The flavors are really mild and it's super, super healthy. If you wanna play with Wild Planet products, they've got a bunch of other fishes like mackerel, trout. Um, guys, it's not cheap. It's not supposed to be cheap. It's wild caught seafood. Wild caught seafood is not cheap. This is a ton of nutrition. This is a ton of protein. This is no sugar. And the fat in this is high in omega-3s. This is a health food product. And this is very, very underappreciated. I'll give you some other examples. So some people are like, oh, well, I tried it. It's a little too fishy for me. What I've noticed is if you're willing to pay a little bit more, there's, a, there's like dozens of brands in the Mediterranean. So we're thinking like um, Greece, Italy, Spain. They're in the Mediterranean and they are making a lot of the seafood and they have some really high, high, high end um, sardine products, canned fish products. Um, I went to Spain and I was just blown away by the quality of the sardines and fish because I'd be ordering it. And then I'd ask them, well, where'd you get it? And they'd literally bring me this. And then I'm, I'm like buying a can at a restaurant, but it tastes better than any sardine I've ever eaten and most fish that I've had. And it's because these brands, uh, this is Ramon Pena, really amazing. Like it definitely tastes different than the Wild Planet stuff. It's really smooth. It's really, really mild. And they make a bunch of different flavored ones. So like this one is with Padron peppers. Um, they're almost always in olive oil. Always check your ingredient label. Uh, but basically, if you're going to buy something from the Mediterranean, Spain, Italy, they pretty much only use olive oil. This whole seed oil thing is a very American thing. And I noticed when I was traveling that it's far more rare to see vegetable oils in other countries. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit on the next segment about fats, but like, how cool is this? We got horse mackerel in olive oil. We've got the, the sardines and peppers. They do them where they're cooked and smoked in different ways. I mean, you can make a meal of this stuff. I do it all the time. You know, if you have a little bit of veg from the night before and it's been a busy day, you crack one of these open, you know, each person gets a can, you get a little mustard, you get your veg. It's a light meal. You wake up feeling great. It's great. This brand, I can't really even pronounce it. This was a very expensive uh, can. Um, it literally was like the most delicious fish I've had in a very, very, very long time. Um, what I recommend is exploring like Amazon. Amazon connects with a bunch of different food vendors from around the country that import this stuff from all over the world. And you might find your favorite one. And oftentimes they have like a nice fun assortment of different products. Play with it. It's really cool. Um, you can also get healthy canned seafood from America. 
I picked this up uh, from Alaska. So this is crab, Dungeness crab from Alaska. It's very expensive, but it's Dungeness crab with salt. Um, I love these kind of canned products because you can take this, make some homemade mayonnaise in one minute, and you will have the most delicious crab salad you've ever had. Um, it's super, super healthy for you. It's super nutritious. You don't have to cook it and boil it and peel it. They've done it for you. Um, and you're supp supporting American fishermen. Uh, I love it. I love it. Um, I try to buy from Alaskan fisheries as often as I can. Um, this is another example, just like pointing something out. You can also go to Costco and from Kirtland get wild caught pink salmon. Uh, what are the ingredients in this guy? Pink salmon and salt. That's pretty good. I'll take that. Uh, this, the example is it's highly affordable. Um, it's wild caught, sustainably caught. It's, you can find it in Costco. Um, probably not as delicious as some of the more premium brands, but a great way to make a little, you know, add this to some homemade mayo and you've got a little like fish, uh, you know, kind of a tuna fish, salmon fish salad, put that on cucumber and you're winning. Anyway, canned seafood is underappreciated. I would really think about including some of that in your diet. It will make your life a little bit easier when it comes to keeping up with your diet. Again, I have, uh, I didn't bring it, but I have a tuna that's literally tuna and olive oil, right? You don't need to put it in vegetable broth. I've seen tuna in clear water. They add weird stuff. I don't really know why they keep adding all of these chemicals. I guess it makes it cheaper for them. It preserves it longer. Um, it's just really sad, you guys. It's really sad because we think we're buying healthy products. And unless we look at the ingredients and know what we're looking at, oftentimes it's being adulterated with like not very healthy things. So good. Look, that is not an extensive, that is just a touching the iceberg, the tip of the iceberg on snacking. Um, I'm going to say one last thing before I let this go. When you're in, when you're driving around and you need a quick bite and you really struggle to find something healthy, I'll tell you my trick. There's a Starbucks on every corner. Starbucks sells egg bites. The egg bites contain eggs and either a little veg or a little bit of meat, like the bacon Gruyere ones is just a little cheese, a little meat and eggs. The ingredients are right there. You can just read them right there. You can buy them at any Starbucks. And if you're in a pinch for a quick meal and you're really hungry, you pick up some egg bites and you're done. And because they're so low carb and they have quite a bit of fat, it will keep you full for hours. That's my move. Um, I have other moves, but you know, no matter where you're at in America, at least there's a Starbucks and those Starbucks are going to have those egg bites. They're very, very popular and they're, they're really delicious as well. So that's great. Next topic is going to be fat. I think fat is very important. And I've mentioned it already a few times. It's the seed oils plus the processed carbohydrates that are making us sick. So removing seed oils from your diet, in my opinion, is probably the hardest challenge because avoiding sugar, corn, wheat, it's pretty obvious, right? Those are labeled, but understanding what fats are being used and how they sneak them in is really, really a thing. So I brought some fats from home. So I'm gonna pull those out. And uh, if you can just pull up a picture of avocado oil. All right, so we're back talking about fats. It's very simple. We wanna avoid vegetable oils, seed oils, and we wanna consume fruit oils and animal fats. Fruit oils would be avocado, coconut, and olives. Um, I think olive oil is the best. Avocado oil is really, really popular. We pulled it up here. Here's the thing with avocado oil. There's some written recent, recent reports that at least in America, the avocado oil isn't 100% pure avocado oil. And so there's, you know, some patients are worried about that. And I have an alternative. Um, why is avocado oil even so popular? When you cook with olive oil, olive oil has a low smoking point. When you smoke an oil, it turns toxic. Okay. So you don't want your oil to smoke. You want an oil when you're cooking or any fat that you're cooking to have a very high smoking point so you can fry it and the oil doesn't vaporize and turn to these nasty chemicals. Avocado oil has a very high smoking point, like above 450 degrees. So you can fry an avocado oil, but again, some people are worried about it. I found a different, more clever solution. Here's what it is. We use extra virgin olive oil. 
That is the healthiest oil you can add to your food. It's delicious. It has lots of amazing flavor, um, EVOO, right? Um, but even though I see it a lot on cooking shows, people are frying in EVOO. EVOO has a very low smoking point. If you fry too high or the, the temperature gets away from you, it starts smoking and creating carcinogenic products. So EVOO is not recommended for like high temperature cooking or deep frying. Everyone's always like, well, if you're deep flying, you gotta use peanut oil or, or canola oil or something. And like, yes, because you're deep frying, it's so much oil, it's expensive to buy uh, high quality oil and and when you're deep frying the temperatures are very high i'm just going to say this one time before the 1960s everyone deep fried in beef tallow beef fat and pork fat or chicken fat that's it that's all we used mcdonald's fries they were always cooked in beef fat okay we vilified animal fat for a number of horrific reasons that makes no human sense um, we then put in these fake fats, right? Like margarine and Crisco. Well, that proved to be like so toxic and caused so many health problems that they removed those. As you guys have noticed, we don't, you know, fast food companies can't use them. No one's using them in restaurants because that stuff is really toxic. And then they left us with these vegetable oils, which are less toxic, but still quite toxic. So if you're going to deep fry, go get yourself some beef tallow. Uh, if you're going to deep fry, you can use some avocado oil. But or, or what I'm talking about mostly is what people are doing at home, which is pan frying. So when I went to Spain, I made this observation and I just observed this. I went to every restaurant nerding out, trying to talk to the chefs. They're really sweet there because the restaurants are small. And I'd look and see what they're cooking in. They would have extra virgin olive oil, something similar to this uh, for salads and for finishing. And they all had extra light tasting olive oil. Every freaking restaurant had this extra light tasting olive oil. I'd never seen this in stores. So I looked into it. Basically, it's an olive oil that has a very high smoking point and a very low flavor profile. So one of the other things why people like to use vegetable oil is they don't have taste. So then you can cook with them and they don't alter the taste of the food you're cooking. Well, this is an olive oil, which is healthy, that has a high smoking point, which is what we're after, and is light tasting. So it doesn't imp impute a lot of flavor on your food. So this is a great option. Uh, is that one extra light? Yes. Now, what's interesting is these are all going to be Spanish and Italian products. I have not seen any store, in, at least in LA, that I've seen stocking these they only stock the evoo so i buy this on amazon i fry in it i cook with it i bake with it and then i finish with the evoo and that's what every restaurant that i ate with in spain did i think it's like the easiest trick in the book because now you just have olive oil and if you're worried about the adulterated avocado oil you don't have to worry about it so much anymore but it does require you to order this stuff online i think unless you can find it in your stores so I, th those are all the fruit oils, coconut oil. Um, I don't use that much simply for the reason that it's so strong in flavor. The coconut flavor is so strong where me and my family were not a huge fan of that. I use it in cooking sometimes like baking, um, but it's great. Uh, coconut oil has a lot of different uses for the record. People use it on their skin. It's used in beauty products. It's a really interesting product. Um, so I'll leave that now. There's a couple of animal fats. I mentioned beef fat, beef tallow. I mentioned uh, pork fat, which is um, uh, lard. Uh, I mentioned chicken fat. I mean, there's duck fat. There's a new product out there that I just saw in the store, duck fat product. I just bought it to cook with. Very excited to see what that tastes like. I, however, want to mention that clarified butter, right? So that's butter that's been, the dairy's been cooked out. Uh, it's called ghee. That's what ghee is. It's clarified butter. Uh, this is a product that's organic, grass-fed, grass-finished, smoking point of 485, has this amazing caramelized taste, high in omega-3s, in fat-soluble vitamins. Uh, I love this product. It's grass-fed, grass-finished. And uh, I don't know what else to say. Uh, there's a bunch of these. Um, I also use a lot of uh, that that fourth fourth and heart is a great version of it. And I use a lot of 
grass fed butter. So the most popular in America is called uh, Kerrygold. And that's from Ireland. Um, that's you're going to find in your stores. Costco recently started carrying a Costco branded uh, grass fed butter. Amazing. Tastes really good and a great price point. And if you're looking for like French butters or European butters, often those are grass fed butters. The cows have been fed grass instead of corn. And uh, that's just more common in Europe and Australia. Uh, in other countries. And so I would never have any other butter than grass fed butter. I have boxes of Kerrygold in my fridge and um, it's delicious. So uh, look, that's it. It's not that complicated. Olive oil, coconut oil, uh, avocado oil. Uh, the trick using the light tasting olive oil for cooking because it has a high smoking point and a low flavor profile and then incorporating ghee and grass-fed butter into your diet as another source of animal fat. And then if you really want to get exciting like I do, uh, playing with your beef tallow, with your pork lard, um, I order that from online sources. Uh, the previous host of this podcast and future guest, Brian Sanders, has an amazing a company called Nose to Tail at nosetotail.org. Uh, I every couple months will buy a large jug of beef tallow from them and I use that to cook with often if I want to add a little beefy flavor to my food. If I if I buy some really great pasture-raised pork, I'll make sure to save the drippings and I, I'll, I'll let that fat separate in the fridge and I'll skim the fat off and I'll have some really, really delicious pork fat that I cook eggs in and uh, like I'll throw it in with some vegetables and add some healthy fat and delicious just flavor. Um, that's really it, you guys, as far as fat goes. Um, it's critical. It's critical. And, and I would do that as soon as you are convinced that this is important. I would go get rid of vegetable oils, change it all out and start using the healthy stuff. I didn't mention during the snack section, biltong. Uh, beef biltong is a different kind of dehydrated beef. Uh, it's basically beef, vinegar, and flavorings. Um, I like it a lot better um, than traditional beef jerky. Beef jerky also has a lot of sugar in it and a lot of like sometimes nitrates and other processed ingredients. This is just dried beef. Now it won't stay on your shelf for a very long time. And once you open it, you got to put it in the fridge because it's really just beef. It doesn't have preservatives. So like people, you know, they want to open it and leave it in their thing and come back a month later. It will grow bugs and mold because it's real food. Uh, it's not covered in sugar and like so preserved that even animals and fungus won't grow on it. Uh, when I see something that gets rotted quickly, I actually realize that that's healthy food because it doesn't contain preservatives. So this is a great snack for me, like one of these uh, packets, which is about uh, 16 grams per serving. And there's two servings in here. So for me, uh, at the end of a night uh, where someone might grab for some chips, if I don't have my siete corn chips or my siete cassava chips, I should say, um, and I feel like I haven't gotten enough protein that day because I picked some lower protein foods, I'll eat half of this. That's my that kind of my like last snack of the night. And then I'll make sure to eat the other half in the next few days and keep it in the fridge. So it's a great way to get two nice snacks. Um, Nose to Tail also has a really great beef biltong product. Biltong, I forget, it's from a different country, really popular, I think Australia or something, but it's a no sugar, basically jerky, and it's delicious. And they make a peppered version of it, uh, at least this company does, and it's just, it's just the best. It's the best snack. Uh, it's my favorite snack um, in general, um, so for what that's worth. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. For the last segment of the podcast, I want to talk about sort of meat produce and dairy. Um, I'll also mention bread. Now this is like a lot of topics, but each one could be its own podcast, right? So what I'm going to do is give you guys the high level stuff. I wanted to really focus on the snacks and some of these basic concepts that come up in clinic a lot, but I'll bring these up. And if you guys have more questions about it, I could always come back to it, but this is just going to be like super high yield concepts for each topic. I won't belabor it. Um, I'll speak quickly, but I'm going to give you a bunch of references. Okay, here we go. So when it comes to procuring meat, um, there's just a couple key critical points. Okay. Grass fed, grass finished beef is superior to not grass fed. Why? 
Because when the animals are eating corn, the fat that they're accumulating in their body is higher in omega-6s than omega-3, so the fat becomes less healthy, right? And there's more fat. Now, when you grass-fed, grass-finished beef, and you let them roam naturally in the prairie eating the natural grass, the fat that they create is omega-3 rich and is really, really healthy, and that beef product is superior. Um, so I encourage people to always procure grass-fed, grass-finished beef. Now, what happens if you can't? Do you not buy the USDA prime beef? Yo, you can still buy it. It's like like a good piece of steak is still healthier than a piece of like uh, eggplant Parmesan, which has very little nutrition, is breaded anyway. You know what I mean? Like, the, like meat is still the thing I recommend. So if you can't get the grass-fed meat, what do you do? Well, buy the leaner cut of meat that's available because the meat itself is still good quality, but the fat is less healthy. So eat less of the fat. Maybe that's where you're getting the filet or just the leaner cut that's available. And maybe you're cooking it a little longer to melt off some of that fat and you're not saving that fat and you're not using that fat. And maybe you're adding a little bit of grass fed butter into it to add some more, more omega threes to improve that omega three, omega six ratio. Um, when it comes to chicken, I think organic is better than regular. Most regular chicken is highly processed. They do all sorts of weird stuff to our chicken production. So what I encourage people to do is always buy the organic chicken. And if you find pasture raised chicken, that's what you're after. Pasture raised chicken uh, that's eating a natural diet is going to have a superior omega three a profile. Um, the meat's going to be tastier. It's going to be just a better food product. And when it comes to chicken, remember the breast is just protein. There's no fat. We have to eat fat to have energy, especially if we're limiting carbohydrates. I think dark meat is the most healthy part of the chicken. Um, and I try to eat the skin when I can, if it's delicious. So like Again, something that most doctors are telling you, just eat the chicken breast. That's crazy. You're going to be hungry in no time. It's just protein. Like you should have the fat that comes with the chicken. It makes sense. Uh, pork, uh, pigs are different. Uh, you also want them pasture raised. It's very, very hard to pot find pasture raised pork. Again, I recommend using these sort of online distributors, people that connect with regenerative farming and regenerative agriculture farms uh, like nose to tail. And if you can get that pasture raised pork, you're going to taste it and you're going to understand how different it is. And again, with that pork, I like to save the drippings because that fat is so delicious. And when it's pasture raised, it's such high quality. You can use it for cooking. You can use it for flavoring. It's just a great way to eat your pork. Um, when it comes to meat, in America, we also eat too much muscle meat and not enough organ meat. It used to be that eating liver, kidneys, uh, uh, using bony cartilaginous parts of the animal and cooking it down into the broth, that used to be like all we did. It was common. We'd, use the, we'd eat the animal nose to tail. We've left that behind. Eating nose to tail is a critical concept. If you eat an animal nose to tail, you're going to get everything you need because the animal has everything it needs and you're going to get everything you need. And that's a foundational concept of like ancestral health and eating an animal based diet. Um, no one wants to eat liver. <laughs> no one wants to eat kidneys. It's very hard to convince people, even if they understand the health benefits. Uh, me personally, buying a little cap that's of dehydrated liver is not my favorite thing. I do recommend liver caps to people that are iron deficient that won't eat that real thing. Um, I think it's a fun way to get the iron without getting constipated from the iron, uh, the, you know, the, the pharmaceutical version of iron. Um, and it's a great way to naturally increase your iron. But uh, in general, there's some really great products. Uh, there's a, a force of nature is a, is a newer brand, uh, that has organ meat blends nose to tail uh, has a product called primal blend. But basically what they're doing is taking muscle meat plus taking a combined combination of organ meats, mixing them together into a ground meat that is like sort of proportional to how much organs are in an animal. I think it's about 30% is organ meat and the rest is muscle meat. And that sort of reflects what the animal's body is. So it's sort of mimicking the nose to tail concept in a product, you know, of, of ground meat. Uh, 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 that company has some really great beef. They also have bison and they have chicken. Uh, I like to make little meatballs out of it, little cutlete. Uh, that's a Russian word for meatballs. 
Uh, you guys can look that up. I, I make them all the time. Um, and we make burgers out of them. Uh, it's a great way to get organ meat in your body. Um, yeah. And then the fish we kind of spoke about recently, uh, I wouldn't get too much farm raised fish. You never purchase fish from like Asia. You don't know what they're feeding it. You don't know what kind of toxins they've been exposed to. I like to buy wild caught fish from America, uh, wild caught fish from trusted sources. Uh, if it says wild caught and sustainable, that's where I'm at. Um, I, I work with a local fishmonger. That's how I get most of my fish. Um, and, and, and there, there's so much more to say about it, but just following these basic principles, yes, wild caught is going to be better. Yes. It's worth spending a little bit of money. It's going to be a higher quality product. Uh, the fat's going to be healthier. The nutrient density is going to be higher. It's going to be great. Um, while we're talking about meat, I'll also mention when it comes to this concept of nose to tail, there is some protein powders that have recently come out that I'm a huge fan of. Uh, you know, the whole feast shake, uh, the whole feast powder, which is by the liver King famously. Um, but the one I generally recommend is cause it's on Amazon. It's by paleo pro it's called carnivore complete. Both products are similar. Essentially they're instead of just protein powder, it's powderized nose to tail, uh, product. So in the Paleo Pro Carnivore Complete product, you've got the beef tallow, the healthy beef fat, you've got the bone broth, which will contain your collagen and all of those little uh, peptides. Uh, this has got the protein from the beef, and I think they use uh, egg protein as well. And they have a blend of organ meats powderized as well in there. Um, it's just a great way to make a shake that's super nutrient dense, that contains some organ meats that you might not have in your diet anyway. Um, it gives you some of that healthy omega-3 rich fat. I like to make a shake uh, with a half a scoop of protein with collagen by Paleo Pro, and then a half a scoop of that Carnivore Complete product. Uh, it ends up being like a really high protein, uh, healthy fat mix. Uh, I'll often give it a shot of date syrup to sweeten it. Date syrup is a sweetener that's all natural, has a very low sugar load compared to things like maple syrup and honey, which are still good, but have more sugar. Um, and they take, and has a great flavor. So you can use it, not consume that much sugar and still get the flavor adding some frozen berries and you've got my shake. Um, I use it all the time. Uh, there's other brands out there. I, I'm just making this point that you don't just need protein. You don't ne just need protein with collagen. There's other great products now that have sort of the nose to tail approach in mind. And you can actually supplement your diet specifically like with the organ meats with this kind of you know, protein shake essentially. And, and it's just a great way. And these things didn't exist just a year or two ago. So it's really exciting to see the food system change in that way. Uh, I'm going to move on to dairy while we're talking about it. So look, dairy, there's a lot of issues with it. Grass fed, grass finished milk. It's better for obvious reasons. Uh, if you can't do beef milk, if you did an allergy test and you've got an allergy to beef, um, Try goat milk. Goat milk is actually the most similar to human milk as far as its nutrient profile. It's really popular to give to babies because it's so similar to human milk and, and it's so consistent with our needs as humans. It's a really great option. I think it tastes great. And again, for people with beef allergies, uh, uh, when you're looking for alternatives to milk, please be cautious just because it says oat milk or soy milk or almond milk. It doesn't mean it's healthy. Um, most of these products have sugar, they have preservatives and they have other flavorants that are not healthy. So look at the ingredients. Uh, I don't consider those alternatives to be healthier than dairy. If you look at almond milk, that's healthy, for example, that has nothing added. It's just almond milk. And you know, it's basically boiled almonds with water. It tastes awful, right? It's not really an alternative to milk. It's just awful tasting water. The, most people drinking almond milk, I look at what they're drinking and it's the ones that are flavored with tons of sugar and often the flavorings like vanilla is chemical vanilla. It's not even real vanilla beans. So look out for the, the ingredients. And if you're not sure, ask someone who knows uh, before you buy it and pretend that it's healthy for you. Most of the alternatives are not healthy. I would also be silly not to mention there's a lot of great coconut products like coconut yogurt. Um, 
that's really delicious, very healthy, and a great alternative to dairy. And then I'll also mention products like kefir. Kefir is really popular in Europe and the Middle East. It's essentially a fermented milk product, similar to like yogurt, but fully fermented. So there's no dairy left in it. There's no lactose left in it. It's really, really high in probiotics. It has natural colonies of bacteria that are really healthy for your gut. It's a great way to consume dairy when you have a lactose intolerance because it has no lactose in it. It's a great way to get uh, the protein and omega-3s from dairy. Uh, and it's a great source of probiotics. You could basically replace it with milk or yogurt in a shake, or you can use it instead of yogurt, you know, and always, 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 always with kefir, with yogurt, with milk, with any dairy product, buy the unflavored version. Just look at a traditional can of Yoplait. Can we, well, you don't have to pull it up. Just look at, look at a flavored Yoplait, like strawberry Yoplait, and tell me how many grams of sugar is in it. Because this is the wild part. They'll take a small can of yogurt and they'll flavor it for you. But the amount of sugar they put in it, it's horrifying. If you saw like in volume how much sugar they put in, you would never put that much in. So I always encourage, get the plain one and add a shot of date syrup, add a little honey, add a lot of, little bit of low sugar jam. Like put in the flavoring yourself because you're gonna put in way less than the company's putting in. Added sugars. So 13 grams of sugar in a small cup. If you look up what 13 grams of sugar looks like, it's so much sugar, you would never put that many spoonfuls into such a small cup. So even if you wanna add sugar to your yogurt, add what you think is appropriate. Don't let the company decide and give you diabetes because they're just trying to make it the most possibly palatable product in the world. Uh, be the controller of your own sugar additives. While we're talking about sugar, uh, the most common source of sugar that's in our diet that people aren't noticing is liquid sugar. So soda and juice. No, orange juice is not healthy. No, it is liquid sugar, right? When you pulverize the orange, you take all the fiber out, you're just creating sugar water that tastes like orange. So I really discourage people from eating too much fruit juice and too much soda. Um, if you're buying soda and, or you're buying juice, always the no sugar added version. When it comes to juices like fruit juices, I always encourage people to dilute it at least like 50, 60%. At first it won't taste as good and then your body will get used to it and it'll taste this just as good as the original product. It'll just be diluted and you'll actually be hydrating yourself a bit more. Most people don't realize when you eat really high sugar foods, your palate gets used to it. When you stop doing that, your palate gets used to even the littlest bit of sugar tastes really good. So if you just train yourself to eat a low sugar diet and train yourself to have a less sweet palate, you, you'll, you'll be set up for better success. Um, there's a really great brand called Spindrift. It's become really popular and it's basically like mineral water with some flavoring. They use a little bit of natural fruit juice instead of sugar or any chemical, like even the stevia that's in my salt. A lot of people don't even want that. So I like Spindrift because it's like less than 5% of real fruit juice and just carbonated water. That's a pretty amazing product and we really support that. I also make my own little sort of soda. Basically, I take like mineral water and I'll add a shot of apple cider vinegar to it. Apple cider vinegar will actually make your water turn to a higher pH and make it an alkaline water when it's in your stomach, uh, which is interesting for other reasons. But um, it's also a great way to make a soda that has an apple flavor. It's good for you and it's really easy. So that's what I have to say about soda. Don't drink your calories. Don't drink your sugar. It's crazy, it's unhealthy, and it's not as fun. If you're gonna have the sugar, have some like delicious product that's you know really delicious and not just sweet drinks. Um, the last thing, I think there's two last things I wanna mention. Bread. So bread is a huge trigger for people. I have an entire podcast about bread with Dr. Bill Schindler. Please look back to previous episodes of the Sapien podcast. Find the most recent episode with Bill Schindler. And we talk about bread for a solid hour. Basically, you want to eat fermented sourdough bread. Long fermented. It's very hard to find. Uh, but the processed bread, 
with the weird chemicals in it that sits on your shelf for two months and doesn't grow any mold on it is not real food and it's bad for you. When you don't ferment your, your uh, wheat, the gluten is potentially and likely toxic to your stomach and is probably contributing to leaky gut and gut dysbiosis on scale. Um, there's also celiac disease, but that's more rare than just being intolerant of this processed gluten. I think most people could probably tolerate for long fermented sourdough bread, uh, but it's very, very hard to find. It doesn't, it's not shelf stable. So you have to get it from a local bakery or a local artisan or your local, uh, uh, farmer's market. And I always encourage if you find it, get a half a loaf, get a small amount and enjoy it. It's really delicious. The glycemic load is low. The gluten product is probably not going to be as toxic to your stomach if you don't have celiac disease. Um, the same goes with corn. Corn is supposed to be, is supposed to go through a process of nishimalization. That's where you soak the corn in a lye solution and it turns into hominy, which is basically this like fluffy corn product. That corn hominy is supposed to be pulverized and turned into masa to make tortillas and the like. When you just take regular corn kernels and you pulverize them, you make a corn that is not nutritionally, uh, Qual. It's not of high nutritional quality. It actually, when you when you nishimalize it, it releases B vitamins, and corn becomes a source of B vitamins. When you process it by pulverization and pressure and heat, you never release the B vitamins, and it just becomes a source of sugar with essentially no if no component of nutrition that's meaningful. So, uh, I whenever I see someone making their own hominy, making their own corn tortillas, I support them, and and that's the kind of corn I I try to pursue. Uh, if you're limited as to you can't find any of the fermented sourdough bread, you don't have a local uh, uh, farmer's market or, or no one's doing it, uh, most stores now can have Ezekiel bread. Ezekiel bread is not perfect, but it's sprouted grains. Sprouted grains are on their way to fermentation. It's a way to think about it. It's a little bit healthier. The glycemic load is better. The nutrient content is better. You'll find Ezekiel bread in the refrigerated section of your grocery store because if you left it on the shelf, since it's real food, it will be, you know, eaten by bugs and fungus, uh, which is like we said, what we want that from our food products. So I keep my Ezekiel bread in the freezer. If we don't have any sourdough and someone needs some toast or whatever, we really need that bread. I pop it out. I toast it. It's delicious. It's a great, like, little cheat code. And I'll leave you with one more thing about bread. Just because it's gluten-free does not make it healthy. Okay. Let's say it again. Gluten-free bread alone doesn't make it healthy. You really want to look at your ingredient list. You really want to understand what you're putting in your body. I've noticed that a lot of the gluten-free breads contain a lot of seed oils. So that doesn't work for me, right? So we, we got to be really thoughtful and bread is really, really tricky. And please listen to the podcast if you have questions about bread. And if you really want to learn more about everything I'm talking about here today, an amazing reference is called Eat Like a Human by Dr. Bill Schindler. You can listen to our previous podcast with Dr. Bill Schindler. He's an anthropologist, a paleoanthropologist that has committed his life to teaching people about our food system and our food history. His book is incredible. It's like a fun read. He's got great stories, personal stories, family stories, while he's teaching you about the food system and the history of how we got here with the weird food system we have. Dr. Schindler is an inspiration. He's got an amazing store out uh, but where he lives on the East Coast. And, uh, you know, I, I look forward to collaborating him with him more. I'm so grateful for everything he's taught us. And, and I really recommend you guys listen to that other podcast. But that's all I'm going to say about bread. Produce. So a couple things about fruits, vegetables. First of all, to get it to your store, looking the way it does, often they put lots of like chemicals on it to preserve it. A lot, some of those chemicals actually ripen, ripen the fruit as it's making it to our stores. Um, it's, you know, eating a diet high in fruits and vegetables is not make it healthy, okay? These fruits and vegetables 
are covered in toxins, often genetically modified. Often they've been surrounded by chemicals like Roundup, Monsanto's, and you know, chemical that kills everything except for the genetically modified organism they're trying to grow. It's a wild system. And I, again, encourage you to learn about, uh, Joel Salatin is an amazing farmer. He's been on uh, the uh, Brian's uh, podcast, uh, peak human. He's been on Joe Rogan podcast. He, he's been around. He he is probably the most eloquent speaker to agriculture practices, farming practices, and produce practices. Uh, so if you want to learn more about our farming system, find a podcast with Joel Salatin, uh, peak human, Joe Rogan. I think peak human was a really good out episode. Um, but, but to suffice to say, our produce is not clean. Every piece of fruit that we bring into our home, we cover in baking soda, we let it soak, we soak, it, wash it and rinse it in baking soda, and you watch all the chemicals and dust and crap come off of it. It tastes different when you eat it. It tastes more like the fruit it, that it is. And um, if you just do this to the next batch of strawberries, blueberries, grapes, and you see the stuff that comes off of it with the baking soda rinse, you're gonna understand why I'm talking to you guys about this. It's an overwhelming toxicity that is being delivered to us from this produce. I encourage you to go to your farmer's market, to local farms, and buy seasonal and local. That's how you protect yourself. A strawberry has no business growing in January. I don't know where they get it from, okay? So I try to buy the, the fruits and vegetables that are of season locally, or if it's from a trusted source, I, I try not to buy too many products that are shipped from far away because it's not really great for our environment. I don't really want to support that. Sometimes I do. Um, I always buy organic except this. So there's something called the dirty dozen and the clean 15. This is super important. Uh, there's an organ, na a national organization that monitors, monitors the amount of toxins we put on our produce. So, and they every year put out a list of the dirty dozen and clean 15. Why don't we pull that up, Chase? I think this one's worth pulling up. So Chase pulled up the dirty dozen and clean 15 for us. And so what is this? So this is an organization that reviews all of the produce. And every year they put out the vegetables and fruits that have the most chemicals on them and the ones that are the least. And so the way I guide people with this is if it's on the dirty dozen, only organic, only local, only organic for sure. And we try to get local and seasonal because it's going to have so much toxin on it. And they are always washed in baking soda, extensively cleaned, maybe even double or triple washed in my house. So what you can see is some of the most common stuff, right? We've got strawberry, spinach, uh, apples, grapes, bell peppers, cherries, blueberries, right? These are things that people are eating all the time. Covered in toxins, covered in pesticides. This needs to be, you need to watch this list and it's pretty consistent year over year. And really like the, the kind of, the kind of amount of spinach and kale people are eating and these products are, you know, they don't overly wash them. They don't worry about them. They don't, they think it's super healthy and, and one, it's hard to digest unless it's cooked or fermented. And two, you know, um, it's pretty, it's pretty covered in chemicals. I, in general, recommend cooking and fermenting most of the vegetables and definitely cleaning and cleaning and cleaning. And then you have another list called the clean 15 and, and Chase could scroll down for us there. And the clean 15, thank you, are products that require the least amount of chemicals. And generally you can probably get away with buying them non-organic uh, because they don't need so many chemicals to make it to market, right? Avocado is a great example, thick rind, right? Uh, really robust and it takes a long time to uh, ripen. So, you know, it, it can, you know, once they pick it, it can last a long time as long as they keep it covered. So that's a great way. And you can just see the list. It makes sense like watermelon, right? Thick rind. But then there's other weird stuff like onions, pineapple. These all have thick rinds, papaya, right? Um, kiwi. But then there's cabbage and, and mushrooms. So it's just interesting to think about, right? Because everyone's like obsessed with getting uh, organic carrots. But really carrots are actually on the clean 15. They don't put too many chemicals on them. Why? They grow deep in the ground and they pull them out and uh, they're ready to go, right? So um, it makes sense when you look at these lists and this is a great way to think about you know, what you're buying, what, what you're fixating on buying local at a farmer's market and what you are kind of more flexible with in a store. 
Um, again, I try to cook and ferment all my vegetables. Uh, I think eating this idea of eating raw vegetables uh, in a setting of a destroyed food system full of toxins, I think it exposes you to more garbage in your body. And I try to avoid that. Everything on the dirty dozen list is stuff that you literally just grab and put in your mouth. Everything on the clean 15 is stuff that requires peeling. Again, it makes sense. If it's got a nice thick rind, it's not, you're not gonna have to cover it in so many chemicals to get it to market, right? So it makes sense. Pe no one thinks about this, but it's just another little tool in your toolbox when you're selecting what foods you're buying, when you're picking, like for example, strawberries. I'll never buy a strawberry if it doesn't say organic. And if I, I'm in California and if I see organic from, you know, you know, uh, San Luis Obispo, right? A couple hours away, let's go. I, I'll trust that, but I'll take it home and I'll still wash it in a baking soda bath because they put something on it to protect it between when they picked it and they came to the store. So something's on it for sure, right? And then there's like, there's other products. There's some fun ones like gooseberries. I don't know if you've ever seen those. They're these little bitty like orange berries. And when you touch them, they literally have a thick chemical goop on it and it's nasty. And like when you wash it, you just see stuff coming off of it. Ugh, it's nasty. It's because it's probably going to rot by the time it gets to market. So rather than not eating it, we find them when we see them organic and then we just triple wash them and all this stuff comes off and then it's like this delicious berry. So look, it's not about being scared or upset about the food system. It's about empowering yourself with the knowledge to bypass it and work around it. Right. And, and we talked about so many little tricks. None of this you can pick up overnight. This took years and years and years, and I'm changing and learning every day. So that's the message here. Slow the podcast down if you need to listen to it, because I was a fast talker. Listen to it twice if you have to. Go check out Flav City. Go check out all, you know, uh, Peak Human Podcast, nose2tail.org. Go to your local store. Spend two hours looking at the ingredients. It, use it as an opportunity. Go there, and instead of being in a rush, look at every single product. If you're confused about how to purchase eggs, uh, I'm going to tell you buy pasture raised eggs and you still don't know how to do that. Go on Flav City's website, find the episode on buying eggs. He spends 15 minutes teaching you every egg product. I wish I had the time to go into the store and do that. Unfortunately, I can't. So I'm just guiding you guys on how to think about this stuff and guiding you to resources. Anyhow, um, I hope this was informative. Um, I thank you for listening. We have some amazing guests coming up later this season. Uh, so for now, thank you for listening and goodbye.